Okay, welcome everybody. We're gonna get started. Uh, welcome to Tropical Fruit Tuesday at two. My name is Jeff Wasileski. I'm the commercial tropical fruit extension agent in Miami-Dade County. And today we're gonna to talk about jamas, jackfruit, avocado, mamey, anona, and star fruit. Uh, this is a topic that the West Coast people in Collier County asked me to talk about. They came up with this. So I said, well, can I steal it from my Tropical Fruit Tuesday? They said, yes, so here we are. And you will be on mute during the webinar and I'm going to try to answer any questions you have in the chat as we go. So we'll see how that works out. So this is Tropical Fruit Tuesday. And next month in June, we're gonna talk just exclusively about the jackfruit. And then in July, everybody knows July is mango time. So we're going to talk about the mango in July, even though this year mangoes are in uh, short supply due to multiple reasons. I do work for UF IFAS and UF IFAS has an extension office in all 67 counties. We also have about, I think it's 12 research education centers. And there is one down here in Homestead where I'm located called the Tropical Research Education Center. And there they have a tropical fruit specialist. They have a tropical fruit entomologist. They have a pathologist. They have an economist. They have a plant breeder. We all actually went out to the field yesterday to look at a, a pataya, dragon fruit grove. So it's uh, very nice for me to be able to work with them and extend the information that they bring from the university to the growers and to you guys. So I always like to start with where can you get good information? Uh, number one place that I would go is something called Ask IFAS, used to be called EDIS. So if you search Ask IFAS, you'll get this screen. It says, what can we help you with? You type in Sapodilla and you'll get a couple of publications on Sapodilla, one of them being how to grow Sapodilla in the home landscape. And that one's probably 12 pages, has all kinds of information, which I'm gonna show you some of that today. Uh, other universities are a good place to get information. Uh, you can search your topic and then EDU and you'll find that. YouTube, I've been watching a lot of um, tropical fruit videos on YouTube as of late. Uh, of course, some of the information might be wrong, but if you watch enough on the same subject, you get the gist of it. Uh, and all the Tropical Fruit Tuesdays are there. This is the 20th um, unique Tropical Fruit Tuesday. So this one will go up later this week. And then they're all there. So you go to YouTube, search Tropical Fruit Tuesday, you'll find ones on uh, jackfruit, mango, avocado, carambola, planting, I IPM, uh, all types of propagation uh, and pruning. Master Gardeners, I know there's some Master Gardeners listening today. So that's a great place to get information is becoming a Master Gardener or from Master Gardeners. Another good place is plant clubs or plant societies. You get a lot of good information by joining them because every month you get a speaker, you, you're with people that like that particular topic. Um, I know there's some rare fruit ones that you can join. Um, number one place is your own garden or your own grove. If you see it with your own eyes, you definitely know it's true. Uh, so keep, you know, keep looking in your garden, keep looking in your grove, keep paying attention. That's very important to find out things, keep scouting. And as always, beware the source of your information because just because it's the first thing that comes up when you search it doesn't mean that it's the, the most uh, correct thing, that the most correct information. So let's get into jamas. We'll start with J, jackfruit. Uh, jackfruit is the largest tree-borne fruit in the world. Uh, it comes from the fig family. It's been around a long time, it has a little salt tolerance, not a lot. Most tropical fruit trees don't have a lot. It has low drought and flood tolerance. So you need to keep the water just right. Um, how do you know when the fruit are mature? They have a dull hollow sign. The spikes 
the little spikes, they kind of flatten out and it will turn a little darker. And they are in season uh, right now. So this is what you find when you open one up. It's got a lot of latex. So if you're gonna try to open one up and get the flesh out, which on the right, you see the flesh, that's the part you would eat. Um, the middle part there on the left, this part is called the rag. Some of this white part is called the rag. And there's a lot of latex. So one of the tricks is to coat your hands and your knife in vegetable oil. That allows you to open it up and, and not have the latex stick quite as much. Still gonna be a little bit of a problem, but it's, it's better. Uh, so this is what the flesh looks like. And then inside each of these bulbs is a nice seed. And one of the things jackfruit has been used for a lot lately is a meat substitute because it's sort of got the texture of pork. So it's used that way very um, successfully. You can also cook and roast the seeds. The seeds are quite tasty. One thing to know when you're growing jackfruit is on the same tree, you're gonna have male and female flowers. They're, they're gonna be separate, but on the same tree. So why is that important? So here's a male before it puts out its pollen, it's kind of flat, kind of smooth. And then the female has these ridges and they're a little bigger. And of course they get much bigger when they get pollinated. Um, but when the tree is young, the male flowers will come out first and no female flowers will come out. So you'll have what you see on the left, the flower will just come out. It looks like a little fruit, but then it withers away so people think that they had fruit and they lost fruit to fungus, but really it's just the males. When the tree is a little bigger, the females will come and then you'll be able to pull fruit. Remember these fruit are gigantic. So the tree needs to be big enough to hold, to uh, support them. So here's a tree on the left. They kind of grow sort of in a columnar fashion. And what I did, I like to control the height of everything if you've seen any of my pruning talks or videos. So what I did is I took out the center, which is the tallest part and allowed it to grow sideways and not quite as tall. One thing to do is after the, the tree flowers, go through and do some spur pruning, which is taking off the old flowering points. That will help that to put out new flowers. So here's a spur right here. You can tell that this one had a flower but it's not gonna flower again. So go ahead and pop that off and you see some other areas here where spurs were, were taken out. So that was J on to A, avocado. So avocado was first introduced to Florida in 1833. So some time ago. In Florida, we have three races, which we'll talk about in a second and the, or actually in general, there are three races. The Mexican race there, the M, that one is leaning towards the Haas, the little purple uh, avocado that, that you see a lot in grocery stores. The Florida avocados are bigger, they're smoother, they're green skin. Um, they're a good source of potassium and they're lower in fat than the Haas. And they're indigenous to tropical America. So here's some of the characteristics of these different races that you have within the um, avocados. You have West Indian, Guatemala, and Mexican. And the origins, the Mexican is tropical highlands. So that's, we can't actually grow hops because of the, the temperatures here and the humidity. So we cannot grow that. So you see that grown in Mexico, you see that grown in California, but not here. Some people a little further up the state are trying to grow it. Um, we'll see how that works out. And blooming season, West Indian, February to March, Guatemala, March to April, Mexican, January to February. And there you see the maturity when they're, when they're ready. And then you get a lot of hybrids of these races, these mixes, and they have intermediate characteristics. And remember guys, you will be on mute, but you can ask questions in the chat. I'm trying to pay attention to that as we go. 
So if you see something that you have a question about that I didn't cover, feel free to pop it in there. So here's some West Indian types that you might've heard of. Donnie, Dupuy, Hardy, Simmons. Simmons and Donnie are very well known. Um, these are some of the hybrids, Guatemalan West Indian types, uh, Nader, Miguel, Theta, Booth 8, there's a couple of booths. There's another one, Booth 7, Choquette, another very popular one. Lula, Lula is used a lot as a rootstock because of this big seed. And Monroe, Monroe is, is very late in the season, good flavor. So the Florida avocado industry is Florida's fourth largest fruit crop. It may be the third, it may have overtaken blueberry, but you have citrus, strawberry, blueberry, avocado. And we have about 7,500 acres, maybe a little less due to Laurel Wilt. The economic impact when you factor everything in is over $100 million. And we have about 450 growers. So like I said, we have about 7,500 acres and it's about 100 acres, 100 trees per acre. So about 750,000 trees. And Longan is the second biggest crop at about 1,200 acres. So you see there's a lot more avocados than anything else. Uh, Bobby says, please mention the more cold hardy for counties further north of Dade. Um, there's not a, a lot of cold hardy um, uh, avocados. They're mostly tropical down here, but if you get some that are mixed with the Mexican race, there would be more cold hardy. So you can, you can find some of those. And Bobby, if you want to reach out to me at my email, which I'll show you at the end, and which you probably already have, I can look for a list of that for you and my cursor is not doing what I want it to do. I'm on a very small little computer. So let's see if I can do anything here. Okay, that's part of the battle. Okay, so avocados have what's called a federal marketing order. And this is kind of interesting. Uh, so you cannot sell, if you're gonna sell commercially, you can't sell your avocados whenever you want. They have to be a certain diameter uh, and a certain weight at a certain time. So if we look at this chart, we have the A date, A date, B date, C date, D date. So if you look at the A date for, let's say the second one, Simmons, it's June 22nd. So you can't sell any Simmons until June 22nd. And they have to be 16 ounces, and that, that diameter, three and nine sixteenths. If they're smaller than that, you cannot sell them. By the B date, by July 6th, they can be a little smaller. By the C date, a little smaller. By the D date, you can sell whatever you want. Um, so the reason they do this is because you can't quite look at an avocado and tell when it's ripe. So people will try to sell early and then the, the avocado is not mature, so it's not gonna ripen so it won't taste good. So that will make the, the fruit terrible tasting and will give the consumer a bad view of that tropical fruit. So that's why they have this federal marketing order. So two things you're definitely gonna see with avocado is I get a lot of calls about avocado lace bug, which looks like this burning on the leaves here to the left. And if you flip it over, you see all these little bugs. These are the lace bugs. Uh, these are pretty easily controlled and they don't cause too much trouble with the fruit. And also they, they tend to come right before the, the fruit, the trees lose their leaves in the winter. So they kind of fall away. Uh, Laurel wilt, on the other hand, a huge problem. Uh, Laurel wilt will kill a tree dead and it is fatal once the tree gets it, it's not going to pull out of it. There's nothing you can do at that point. Laurel wilt is a fungus that's moved by a tiny little ambrosia beetle. 
The ambrosia beetle is the size of, um, if you look at a penny, look at the numbers on the year, maybe two of those numbers, the ambrosia beetle is that small. Uh, carries this fungus, it drills into the wood to grow the fungus for its young. And the tree hyper reacts to the fungus and seals off its own water supply and it can no longer get water. Uh, so it wilts and it looks like this. So you have these trees where the leaves are just completely brown and they die so quick, the leaves don't drop off. So if you see that, that's a good um, idea. You may have a good idea that you have lower wilt and it can move. If, in this case, you see three or four trees right next to each other in a grove. They're bigger trees, so their roots are actually touching. So they went, the, the, the disease went from tree to tree through the roots because the roots are grafted together. So it can actually pass things through there. Like if you take a tree in a grove and cut it down and paint it with Roundup, it'll kill the trees next to it because the roots are all connected. So it can move by the beetles, like I said, and it can move if you move the wood around. If you take some of this wood and move it somewhere else, you carrying the beetles. So here's a grove that was completely killed by Laurel Wilt. There are things you can do if you have a grove. One thing is to scout, to constantly look for Laurel Wilt. If you see it, pull that tree out immediately and pay attention to any trees around it that might have it. Uh, get rid of that tree, uh, burn it or uh, chip it so it doesn't spread because it'll spread very quickly. So we've lost probably over 140,000 trees to lower well. Here's a, a aerial view of a grove that was pretty beaten up and you see the piles of burnt um, wood and the chippings where they tried to get rid of it, what was there. So this is something you might see on the trunk. If you get a good rain, you're not going to see this. But these little straws that you see on the left, that's where the beetle drills in and pushes out these little sawdust straws. Uh, there are other ambrosia beetles that can carry the fungus. And some of them make these little crystal volcanoes. So that's another thing you can see. But just because you have the straws and the volcanoes doesn't mean you have lower wilt. The true test is that wilting. So if you chip into the wood, you can see these holes. These are the beginnings of the galleries where they're gonna make these little wooden or little galleries within the wood where they grow the fungus. Um, so now we're moving on. We did J, we did A, now we're doing M for Mame. So Mame, there's two main cultivars, Magania and Pantene. Pantene is sometimes also called Key West. Meme, then send the Sapotaceae. We're gonna talk about a few other trees in the Sapotaceae besides Meme, just touch on them. Um, they like a lot of miners, the, the Meme. Sapodilla, which is related, doesn't need as many miners. Minor elements, I'm talking about like iron, uh, manganese, boron, zinc, uh, things like that. And they can have multiple crops. So if you look at this picture, you see the bigger fruit that are getting ready to be picked and you see the next year's crop, the smaller fruit. And you can kind of see some little flowers which might be the next crop after that. So this makes it difficult to prune MAs because typically you're gonna prune right after you pick the last fruit. So the tree can recover from, from the pruning. But this one always kind of has fruit. So you, if you're gonna prune, you're probably gonna take off some of the fruit. So you have to be careful when you're pruning. So here's one that's very iron deficient. So some chelated iron, a chelated iron drench would bring this tree back. And mames can decline uh, pretty rapidly if you don't keep them pumped up and watered. So they are brown, they look like a football. So how do you know when they're mature? So this one on the left, he nicked it with a knife. And you can see that where the nick is, it's green underneath to the left of the knife there. And the one on the right, you see right here, the nick underneath it's orange. So when it's orange, that tells you it's mature and it will ripen. You can take it, put it on your uh, kitchen counter, it will ripen, it will be ready. So jumping off M into 
sapodilla, just to give you a quick touch on sapodilla, and we're going to do canista real quick. It's also in the sapotasi, and this kind of information is what you'll find in Askyphus. Remember, I told you about Askyphus. You can search that, put in sapodilla, you'll get all this the origin, the size, relatives. Um, then you also, on most of these tropical fruit, you get a chart like this, which is great. It's a it's all the months of the year, and it tells you what to do during each month. So we look over on the left, and we see when to fertilize, when to do micronutrients, when to irrigate, when to do insect control, when to prune, and when to harvest. So these charts are great. Uh, if you're a commercial or a homeowner, they're really, really um, something that you can use well. So can cell also in the sapotasi called the egg fruit. Um, sometimes if you open up the and look at the flesh, it does look like um, a hard boiled yolk, the, the yellow. It's very easily managed. You can prune it to keep it how you want it. It produces rather well. There's a, another fruit that is called the leucoma that's related to canistel that you can't grow in South Florida. So if you know someone who really likes leucoma, you can um, grow canistel for them. So I'm getting a direct message and it says the county has no fertilizing and it's kind of cut off. But yeah, I was thinking of that when I was talking about the fertilizer. Um, in Miami-Dade County, starting now, you cannot fertilize with nitrogen or phosphorus if you're a homeowner. If you are a commercial grower, you can still use fertilizer, uh, but homeowners cannot use nitrogen or phosphorus. That's NP, the first two numbers in the fertilizer. The last number, potassium, I believe you still can use. And that's the one that really helps flowering and fruiting. So you, I'm pretty sure you could do just straight potassium, um, just a little bit on your tropical fruit to keep them happy. And certainly you can do minor elements. So there's a picture of, uh, I think that's a Bruce Kenza. So JMA, now back to A. For anonas, so we have a lot of different anonas that we can grow. Um, we can grow the cherimoya, which is that one there, also called bullock's heart on the left. Um, sugar apple, very popular, very sweet. Adamoya there on the left. Adamoya is a a hybrid of Anona squamosa and Anona cherimola. We can't grow the cherimola, which is also called cherimoya. Uh, that one we can't grow, but we can grow um, squamosa, which is the sugar apple seen here. So this would be one Adamoya. If you try to grow it from seed, it wouldn't come true because it's a, it's a hybrid. Uh, then we have the soursop, also called guanabana. These can get very large. These are more cold sensitive. So they're a little harder to get them to grow. All of them have issues with pollination. And I'll show you why in a minute. The guanabana, this is a picture on the left of the guanabana. It gets these little bumps that people will get upset about. But those are actually an Aranos mite that doesn't really do a lot of damage. So you don't need to worry too much about it. But you might see that and, and be upset. Um, <clears throat> what is a problem is this mummification of the fruit on the right. So you have these little seed borers and you see the circle there. The seed borer goes in, opens up the tree to fungus, and then you get um, this mummification, which is a real problem. So there are some sprays you can do, but if you're trying to grow without spraying too much, um, uh, you can, uh, you can, what you can do is remove all the fruit that are mummified, bag them up and get them away. So the cycle of the insect doesn't keep going. That's something you can just be really, really, um, culturally sound. Um, so Rocco has asked, 
and in a direct message, what's the best way to fertilize a nonas? So they, they, they're a typical fertilizer that you would use, just minor elements in 839, something like that. And 839 is nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. Um, I'm not sure, I think it's October when the, when the fertilizer ban ends. I'm not sure of that. If anybody knows, can put that in the chat. Um, but another, another thing you can do since you can't really use nitrogen or phosphorus in the growing season, which is typically when you would fertilize, uh, another thing you can do is a lot of mulching, a lot of compost, that will help a lot. Um, I haven't found that they get real hungry, that they need a lot of, uh, thank you, Veronica, she put October 31st uh, is the last day of the fertilizer ban. Um, but I haven't found that they need a lot of extra fertilizer like, like a carambola does or like an MMA. Um, they're more like a sapodilla where they're, they're pretty hardy. Um, one thing that they do do though, which I'll show you in a minute uh, after this, and this is what I was talking about when I said that they're, 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 they don't give fruit well, they're hard to pollinate. They don't get pollinated easily. That's because a single flower, it turns, starts female and then it turns to male. So you see on the left when the flowers open and they're tight like that, that's a female. Then when they open further on the right, that's a male. So the, the females are ready, but the males aren't ready yet. So they, it, it's harder for them, for the insects to, to cross over and, 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 and get them pollinated. So hand pollination is an option. What you would do is wait till you get these males opened up and collect the pollen in a little container with a little brush. And then the next day, when the females are there like this, you sort of pry them open and pollinate them. That will give you much better fruit set and much better fruit size as well. So here's a male and a female. The, oh, actually it's a female on the left and a male on the right. The male opens up, you can see the pollen down there. So there's a female with one of the parts of the flower taken off. So you can see that will be sticky when it's ready to accept pollen. And then here's the male, you can see all the pollen. So they're easy to, pr to prune and to manage. You can keep them smaller, you can prune them. They come back really nicely. Um, you wanna prune them sort of in the, in the winter before they get ready to flush out. They're gonna look real ugly in the winter uh, and then they're gonna come back. So you wanna do it kind of when, when they're looking real ugly, you're gonna prune them and they do put out uh, new flowers on the new growth. So the pruning really helps. So like I said, in the winter, they do get ugly. So this will be a time that people will call up and say, oh, my, my sugar apple just looks terrible. What's going on? But that's normal for this time of year. In the winter, they just get ugly, then they lose all their leaves and they come out with fresh leaves. So, Jamas, we're down to the S, which I call the C. So, star fruit, also called carambola. So, carambola, like a lot of miners, they can use some wind protection if they can get it. They're very heavy producers and they produce more than once per year. So here's a couple trees that really need minor elements. They really need some iron, um, probably nitrogen as well. So this is what happens if you let them produce and produce and produce and don't feed them. This can happen. So we'll just look at a few cultivars real quick. Uh, I have some pictures of some of these. So you have Arkin, Huang Tung, Kerry with a K, B10, Tree Kambangan. Uh, I have an Arkin and a Tree Kambangan in the in the nurse or in the 
the Grove at work and they both produce very well. Kajang, Laura. So most of these are sweet. B10 is probably the sweetest. Um, all these are, they all fruit very well. So here's what Arkin looks like. It's sort of got that curve to it. Medium sized fruit um, recommended for commercial planting. Um, B10 recommended as well. Plant with other cultivars for cross pollination. So don't just put all B10s. B17 needs cross pollination. Wang Tung has that different color to it. It's a little squat. Not really recommended commercially, but a good dooryard tree. Cherry, recommended and uh, comes from Hawaii. Sort of longer, good color. Kajang, it's got a little curve to it. Tree Kambangan, these are longer. Recommended as dooryard, may have potential as a specialty carambola. Lara. And I might have mentioned it earlier, but we're recording this, so this will go on YouTube. So if you need to see these again, you certainly can look that up by going to YouTube and searching Tropical Fruit Tuesday uh, space Jamas, and you'll find this one or you'll find all the other ones as well. So just a quick word about pruning carambolas. I talked about canistels and um, anonas are pretty easy to keep pruned. So are carambolas. So here's the tree, tree cambangan that I had. And this one was just straight up. The tree was going straight up. So I took the center out one the first year where you see that circle. And then the second year, so I'm trying to get it to grow sideways. So the second year you had these three vertical, strong vertical shoots. So the second year I took those out like this. So there's the tree, there's the vertical shoots in the circle, and there it is after it's pruned. So the height is kept uh, at about six feet. And that's all I took off with those, with those three, just trying to get it to go sideways. Very easy. So this is year uh, three. So you see the original cut here. You see in the circle, that's one of the, um, ones from the second year that I took off. And then now you see these strong verticals again. So I'm just gonna take that out. So again, it looks like almost the same picture, but it's just maintaining that height year after year. And there's what I took out again, just three, three um, shoots. So we have a question, when is the best time to cut? So when's the best time to prune? Uh, typically you want to do it after you pick that last fruit. So when the crop is done and you pick the last fruit, and sometimes carambolas will already have flowers. So it's not perfect, but uh, you want to do it right after you pick that last fruit and then you prune. But they, they respond really well to pruning. So even if you prune off some of the flowers, you're still going to get a good crop. So that's Jamas. We're going to end up with um, just some bonus information on bananas. Bananas like water and fertilizer. There's many, many types. Um, a banana stalk will die after it fruits. So it will actually sucker out. It will propagate with suckers. Um, and they are disease prone. They can get a lot of fungus. Um, so there are some called the FIA types that are a little more disease resistant that you can get. Uh, one of those is called Sweetheart. One of those is called Mona Lisa. Um, I'm blanking on the third one, um, but look for the FIA types. So I have another question. What's the best food for carambolas? Oh, what's the best food for carambola? So again, an 839, just a typical tropical fruit special works good for carambolas and then minor elements. Uh, Anna asks, have you had any serious issues with scales? So for carambola. 
So definitely there's a scale called the lobate lack scale, this little black scale that gets on the smaller um, twigs that can be a problem. I don't see it on the fruit that much, so that's good. But what I do notice is it's on the older sort of dead or dying um, twigs. So a good pruning, not only are you gonna take out the strong verticals like I showed you, but you're gonna go in and get all those old twigs, all the dead twigs and get those out because that will get rid of a lot of the low bait back scale. So here's what a banana clump will look like on the left if you let it go. And here's what you want it to look like on the right. You want one main tree, one main stalk, then another medium stalk, and then a smaller stalk. And you want to take off any dead fronds so all the light can get to the trunk. That's important. So there we see uh, Anthony Rodriguez. He took quite a few man hours and took down what looked like on the left to make it look like what it does on the right. And all of the, the vegetative material that he cut up or that he cut down, he chopped it up. So on the right, this picture here, he just mulched everything in place, which I think is a good idea. And then what he also did is some of the, the ones that he cut down, he tried to take like a shovel and just get the heart of them out so they don't re-sprout. Uh, Richard asked, is there a stage when they're too big to split and replant? So I like to, and, and talking about bananas, I assume, I like to um, get them when they're, I wouldn't try to take them when they're more than like four feet tall. Uh, you can do it though. And you just have to, when, once you pull them apart, you just have to, when you plant them, you have to make sure they don't fall over because they don't have a lot of roots. So I like to do it when the pup is about the third of a size of the parent. That's a good time. Um, but they propagate very easily, very, very well by suckers. So here's what it looks like when the flower first comes out and then it will start putting out fruit. The, the flowers are very pretty. And I get questions like, when you know when to pick? So that one on the left, when you know when to harvest? That one on the left is very close, but I like to wait till one or two of the fruit towards the top turn yellow, and then you know the whole thing is going to, um, to ripen. So you could pick that and the whole thing would ripen. So the way you do it is you go up to the top you actually, you hold the bottom and then you go up to the top and you chop the top and you're holding the bottom so the whole thing doesn't fall. And then you wanna let that sit for quite a while, maybe for a day, because if you start taking the bananas off right away, all the sap is gonna come out. The sap will actually stain your clothes as well, so be careful about that. So let it sit, let it just hang for about a day. Um, there's a happy boy with his bananas. So just want to remind you, we do have another Tropical Fruit Tuesday, June 28th. We'll do a deeper dive into jackfruit. July 12th, we'll do mango. There's a lot of um, tropical fruit festivals popping up in the next couple of months. There's going to be one at the Fruit and Spice Park. Uh, there's going to be one down in, I think it's Big Pine Key. Um, I'll, I'll be talking at, at the one in Big Pine Key. Uh, Fairchild is bringing back their mango festival. So I'll be doing one there as well. Uh, Rebecca. Oh, there's two questions. One, how long after you cut it do you wait for it to yellow? So you can eat bananas when they're green and you can wait till they're yellow. but um, I would just wait like a day for the sap to get out and then you can divide them. And then based on where they are in the bunch, the ones at the top will turn yellow first and the bottom ones will turn yellow later. And it can take up to a week for the ones on the bottom. Uh, Rebecca asks, what's the best way to identify bananas? That's difficult. Um, there is somebody named um, 
Don Chafin, who owns a place called Growing Bananas, he's really good at identifying bananas. So I cheat and take mine to him if I need an uh, identification. And he has a good website where you can look. There's also a couple of good books um, that will tell you how to identify bananas. One good thing is if you know the parent plant, if you know the name of that, if you take a sucker of that, it's a clone of the parent. Uh, Richard asks, is there an optimal way to treat the flower? I heard some people cut the flower after it stops producing. Uh, you don't need to do that. Oh, I'm not sure if you mean the, when, when you cut off the stalk, you're cutting off the flower. So that takes care of that. But the actual stalk, if that's what you're talking about, that will never produce again. So yeah, you wanna take that out and just mulch it up into the um, rest of the tree. Uh, hopefully that answered your question. So now I have uh, something I would like you guys to do for me. If you would take your phone and I'm also gonna put this into the chat. Just do a quick uh, two to three minute survey. You can open your phone, point at this QR code, open your phone and put it to your uh, camera. Then point at this QR code, it'll give you a link. You can do it on your phone or you can click on the link in the chat. And just a quick two to three minute survey that will help me make these better for the future. Um, that would really help a lot. I wanna thank you guys for coming. And uh, really appreciate you guys showing up. I know there's lots of things to do these days. So I'm gonna stop recording.